In Collier County on the west coast of Florida, there's an airport runway that goes nowhere. There are no control towers or terminals or hangars. Over 50 years ago, there had been a dream to build an airport of the future, the largest one in the world, five times the size of JFK. And this two-mile stretch of tarmac in the Florida swamps is all... Well now, Marjorie here. It's not just any old swamp. It's part of the vital ecosystem that gives Floridians the water they drink. And though this swamp may not be the prettiest sight to see, it's home to the Florida panther, the manatee, and the American crocodile. And I imagine they would prefer to not share their home with a fleet of jets, no matter how futuristic. An airport there would be absolutely devastating to Florida as we know it. Only a money-grubbing, short-sighted fool would think it was a good idea. And you were recruited to fight those fools. Yes, I suppose my reputation preceded me by then. And you could say, I wrote the book. But we should probably start from the beginning. In 1915, 25-year-old Marjorie Stoneman Douglas moved to Miami and found her calling as a writer for the Miami Herald. For years, she was notorious for her columns on controversial topics. Eventually, at the age of 52, Marjorie decides to finally write her book. After five years of research, The Everglades, River of Grass was published in 1947. It sold out in a month. The poetic way she chose to depict the land's beauty and significance, combined with her dedication to science, moved people to appreciate the useless swamp as an important ecosystem for the entire region. There are no other Everglades in the world. Nothing anywhere else is like them. Their vast glittering opening, wider than the enormous visible round of the horizon. The racing free saltness and sweetness of their massive winds, under the dazzling blue heights of space. They are unique also in the simplicity, the diversity, the related harmony of the forms of life they enclose. That same year, the Everglades was officially designated a national park. Its land, plants, and animals would be forever protected. But while the land itself was protected, the waterways that fed into it were not. Only a year later, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began a massive water control project. They built 1,400 miles of canals and dams to divert water away from the Everglades, drying up the land and upsetting the delicate balance of the ecosystem for the benefit of sugarcane growers and land developers. So the Corps became Marjorie's number one nemesis, and the competition for that spot was fierce. In the late 1960s, a developer wanted to build an oil refinery on 2,200 acres of land in Biscayne Bay. Marjorie said the idea was so ridiculous that it compelled people who would not normally be activists to join the environmental movement, which was a good thing because Florida's beauty and the Everglades were constantly at risk. Yes, one thing I've learned about environmental causes, the most dangerous time is after some project has been stopped. The opposition senses the lull and uses the occasion to spawn numerous other idiocies that ought to be stopped. Well, Marjorie, speaking of idiocy, that brings us back to where we started, an airport of the future smack on the border of the Everglades. Well, this part of the story starts in a grocery store, actually. A grocery store? Yes, I was at the quick and easy food store. It was quite late, but I needed to buy cat food. And I ran into Judy Wilson from the National Audubon Society. I knew she and her boss, Joe Browder, were fighting the jet port. I told her that was great. What they were doing was wonderful. And she looked me square in the eye and said, Yeah, what are you doing about it? I told her what I told you. I wrote the book. But she replied, that's not enough. So I said something to the effect of, well, I'll do whatever I can. And that gave Joe Browder his opening the very next day. Joe shows up at your house? Yes. <laughs> so Marjorie and Joe drove to the site. A landing strip had been built there already, slashed across the flow of the water. She knew the airport would be devastating and only the beginning of development in the area. Marjorie decided to help, but she knew she needed more voices than hers. In 1969, the Friends of the Everglades was born at a book signing when an Army Corps of Engineer reservist, remember her old enemies, 
became the first member. He and Marjorie agreed $1 was a good amount for membership dues, so anyone would be able to join. Marjorie was 79 years old when... What does my age have to do with it? I lived to be 108. In 1969, I was still in my prime. Well, Marjorie, we want people to know that you're never too old or young to make a difference. Marjorie supported the Friends of the Everglades through countless speeches, winning new members at every appearance. Within two years, the organization had 3,000 members from 38 states. I always said, I'll talk, I'll talk about, about the Everglades, Everglades at the drop of a hat. Facing a huge grassroots opposition, the government had no choice but to shut the project down. President Nixon even pushed to turn the area into a national preserve. It was officially established in 1974, and Big Cypress National Preserve is larger than Rhode Island. Though Marjorie died in 1998, Friends of the Everglades is still around today, fighting water pollution and oil drilling and protecting endangered species like the Florida panther. As Marjorie predicted so many years ago, one battle is barely won before a new threat pops up that could change our world forever. Speak up. Be a nuisance where it counts. Do your part to inform and stimulate the public to join your action. Be depressed, discouraged, and disappointed at failure, and the disheartening effects of ignorance, greed, corruption, and bad politics. But never give up.